so today I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between validation and calibration. Now, calibration is the idea that you modify the parameters of your model such that you create a more valid model a lot of times, right? So we have our standard arrow comparing validation, which is comparing the model to the real world outputs, right? Calibration means adjusting these parameters such that the model outputs more closely correspond to the real world outputs. Now, in order to do that, in order to do that in a way that does not just match the real world, you often wind up modifying your real world data and splitting into two groups, a training data set and a testing data set. And one of the questions that comes up a lot is, if I match well against the training data, does that mean I'll match well against the testing data? If you do, then your model is considered to be more valid to some extent. Um, and, but just as a small note, and just for completeness, sometimes the training data has a different environmental setup than the, than the testing data. For instance, you might be training the model in one particular geographical location and then testing in another, right? In which case the model setups, the, the environmental variables might be different. So once you have those notions down, then you can think of calibration essentially as a search. Uh, uh, and so calibration is finding subset of parameters P star such that it minimizes an error function which compares uh, the real world training data to the model uh, with, the, with the parameters plus whatever inputs you need from the, from the environment, right? Uh, and then you can carry out the assessment, the validation component, once you've done the calibration, by looking at the testing data set. Um, so one way you can do this is you can use machine learning. You could also just use brute force and search all the possible notions. Um, and one question that comes up is what error function should you use? Like how should you actually compare the training data? And if you remember back to the last lecture, in that case, we actually used an R squared value, right? As you know, comparing it. A lot of times the measure is determined by the particular field you're working in, or maybe the, the type of data. If you're using time series data, it might be different than if you're using a point mean or something like that, right? Um, in a paper that a lot of this work that I'm talking about today is based off of, uh, which I did with Forrest Stonedahl, um, what we did was we looked at different measures. We looked at correlation, and then uh, there's a set of measures called uh, the, the L distances, right? Which basically um, are different ways of seeing how different two sets of numbers are. So L0 just means if you have two series, two vectors, anytime they differ, you count that as a difference between them, right? And then L1 is often referred to as the Manhattan distance, where you just take uh, the absolute values of the differences between each one and you add those up, right? L squared is the Euclidean, or um, sometimes also the um, uh, referred to as the, the root error, right? Uh, where you take the, the distances uh, between the actual value and the real world value, you subtract those off, you square it, and then you add up all those squared errors and then take the square root of the squared errors. So you get the root mean squared, or the root squared error in this case. It's not the mean, but you could do the mean as well. Um, and then there's um, what's known as the Chebyshev or the maximum difference, where you just take the maximum distance between any of those two inputs and look at them. And in the paper I did with Forrest, what we showed is that these different measures each actually calibrate the model to do well for a different validity measure. So none of these measures necessarily is the best. It really depends upon what you want the model to excel at. Um, and that is a question that you have to decide when approaching your model. Now, you might look at all this and be like, oh my gosh, this is overwhelming. How could I possibly do this, right? Well, it turns out there is a nice little tool that Forrest wrote in order to make this easy to do, uh, and it's called behavior search. And what behavior search does is allow you to take a data set that you have, well, it actually allows you to take a model that you have and run it to maximize or minimize um, some behavior, right? And it will automatically calibrate the model's inputs given the ranges of inputs you're allowing it to look at to maximize or minimize that function. And so you can define a function which is the relationship between uh, your model output and real world data. 
and then use behavior search to minimize that function and thereby automatically calibrate your model. Um, to go into this is a little bit beyond the scope of uh, this particular class. Uh, I'll bring up an example of behavior search just so you can see it, uh, but uh, it, you know, to, we'll see how far we can get in terms of looking at it. So let me bring that up. Okay, so now we're gonna get into how to actually use behavior search to do calibration, right? Uh, and it's much easier now than it used to be. Behavior search is now part of the NetLogo package. So when you download it, if you go to your NetLogo 6 folder, you'll see a behavior search uh, that you can uh, select. So you can double click on that and it'll bring up an interface. It looks a little bit like this. It'll be slightly different because I've actually started to load in the model parameters, uh, but I'll show you how to do that as well. Uh, but it'll be a similar interface to this, right? Uh, so that makes it very easy uh, to use behavior search. Uh, and behavior search is not just for calibration, I should mention. We're gonna talk about it in terms of calibration here, uh, but it also has a lot of other uses as well, right? Um, so let me explain. Uh, first of all, in order to use it for calibration, we have to modify the NetLogo model. So I'm gonna start by uh, talking about the NetLogo model uh, and what I had to do to modify it, right? So here is uh, model seven from our uh, from our original unit four exercises, right? Um, and we had to do a couple of things that are a little different. Uh, first of all, you'll notice right at the top, I'm using the CSV extension. This just makes it very easy to read in um, the empirical data that we want to calibrate. So what we're going to do for calibration here is we're going to take the diffusion of an information model that we have from unit seven, and we're going to try and calibrate it to a uh, empirical data set of innovation adoptions that people have, right? Uh, and so the nice thing about that is then we're then going to get parameters that best fit that diffusion curve that we saw, right? So I have this um, CSV extension right here that uh, I had to bring in in order to read in the empirical data. And then of course, I actually have to have a read in data procedure and this read in data, and I'll make all these files available so you'll have access to them, but um, it's going to read in adoption.curve.csv and that's our empirical data. Uh, and essentially all it's doing is it's, um, reading in uh, for a number of different products, it's just reading in um, how many units were adopted at each time period, right? Uh, and so then it can use that to kind of compare to the adoptions that are happening in the actual model. And then the other thing we had to add was we had to add an error function. So as we talked, as we just saw in the video, right, we have to compute the error between our model data output and the actual output, right? So we're gonna add this compute MSE uh, function and this compute MSE function is going to take two time series and it's just gonna compute the mean squared error between those time series. And so what those two time series are, one of them is the model data, right? As it's been commuted and the other one is uh, the empirical data, right? And of course, you know, we're going to have to deal with some issues because, for instance, the model might run longer or shorter. So we have to modify the, um, the, the time series to match each other exactly. And then once we do that, mean squared error is just as you might expect it to be, uh, simply a, a map of the, um, uh, the error, the, how different the two terms are from each other, squared, right? and then averaged over the across the entire time series, right? So we're gonna use this map function, which we'll get into unit uh, nine, where we'll talk about that in more detail, um, to compute the, the, the squared error, and then we're gonna take uh, the sum of the squared errors and divide by the length to get the mean squared error, right? Um, and so this is a measure of how different the time series are from each other, right? We take the differences between each point, we square it, and we take the mean of those differences to give us some average measure of the distance. And of course, in order to do that, we actually have to add in a couple of other little things, right? So if you go up to the um, uh, go command, we now have this model adoption uh, time vector where we're actually keeping track of the fraction of turtles that have adopted every time so that we know how much it is, right? Um, and uh, you know, those, uh, compute MSE doesn't actually get called anywhere in the model, and that's because we don't need it to be called. We only need to be called 
by the behavior search function when it's figuring out the error. Okay, so that's what we had to do to modify the model. Um, that's not baked into behavior search, right? There's no like automatic error cal calculation. Uh, we're uh, coming up with ideas about how to do that. And Forrest and I just had a conversation about modifying behavior search, but uh, you know that's not right now baked into it. So let's go back to behavior search and. This is gonna be a little harder to see. Unfortunately, yeah, you, you can't modify the font size on behavior search, so I'm just gonna um, have to basically explain it as best I can. You could, hopefully you can blow it up on your computer and look at it in more detail. But what I did, right, when I load up behavior search is the first thing I have to do is I have to load in the NetLogo model. So I select the model and I hit open and it'll load it up. And then this is not normally set up like this. It'll be, you know, a, a set of default parameters. So I, I can load the parameters from the model and that allows behavior search to know what parameters it can manipulate. And uh, here, right, it's going to default to loading the ranges that are set up in the model, right? Uh, but for instance, let's say we don't really want it to like, so we're trying to match the parameters of the model to match the empirical data, but maybe there's some parameters that we wanted to have fixed. So for instance, the number of agents, we want to be fixed at 100, right? We don't want it to manipulate that as one of the parameters, right? So then we can modify that, right? So once we've got our parameters running and selected the way we want, and of course it's gonna search across all these different parameter spaces that we've left open besides the one that we fixed, then we have to set up the model run itself, right? And so behavior search needs to know what the setup command is, what the step command is, the go command. Then it needs the measure it's gonna use to try and compute whether or not this model run is a good model run. And that's that compute MSE. And we're gonna to have to give it, uh, so if you look at compute MSE, right, it takes two arguments, uh, the, the two time series it's computing and so what are those two arguments? Well, one of them is going to be that uh, model adoption, right, that we had. And the other one uh, is going to be the actual product data, right, which was this product data that we specified before. So we're going to compute MSE product model adoption. It doesn't really matter which order you put them in because... Um, uh, the way we wrote the function, it'll automatically adopt, ad adapt correctly. And then you also want to put in a stop condition. You know, we already have a stop condition in our data, so we'll just, or in our model, so we'll just use that stop condition, right? And then you can also give an optional step limit. Um, so this just means that, you know, that when it's going to stop. And since everyone should be adopted by a thousand time steps, we'll put a thousand there. Uh, then you have to select whether you want to minimize or maximize fitness. It actually defaults to maximize, so we want to select minimize. Um, whether you collect the measure at the final step or along the way, and there's a bunch of other things, and you can select whether you want to GA or simulated kneeling, random hill search, right? Random uh, search or mutation hill climber. We're going to use a GA. I like GAs. They work well for agent-based models, so we'll do that, right? So then once we have all that, we should be able to hit run behavior search and then hit start search and hopefully it will run successfully. It'll start running the model. It'll run it multiple times. Um, it's running this GA and there you go. And there's the results, right? So it's computing the mean squared error of the, of the solutions it's come up with all along the way. And as you can see, they keep decreasing, decreasing until finally it finds one that has a fitness of 0.157466, right? Um, and you know, it then gives you the parameters. It had a hundred agents, which we specified, a broadcast influence of 0.1, a social influence of 0.75. This seems very into the standard kind of setup. Uh, density of the network was 0.3, preferential attachment network, fraction of influentials, and the influential weight, right? So there you go. Now we have a, a model that is at least calibrated, and of course we could run the, the, the search for longer, farther, better, right, to calibrate it more and more. And though this is only one set of results, uh, behavior search is actually on the back end outputting a whole bunch of other results if you wanted to get, like, what was the point to generate this mean squared error and this mean squared error and so forth, right? Okay, well, that's it for calibration and behavior search and hope you've uh, helps understand what's going on here.